Bulletin. We have next Sunday a special event. It's uh, actually Halloween next Sunday. So we have a fall festival following worship next Sunday at 1030. And we're asking the young children to wear their Halloween costumes to church, which would be a lot of fun. And then we're going to have a fall festival, some games for them on the front lawn after worship. And maybe even some stuff for us old folks to do. And we'll have a chili that will be served for lunch. So you can stick around and have a very informal lunch, watch the kids play, and it'll be a lot of fun. That's next Sunday after the 1030 worship. Also, this coming Friday, we have an adult fellowship at the home of Malcolm and Deborah Cooper. Uh, we ask that you bring an appetizer to share to that event. It's a very fun thing to help uh, us get to know each other better. So that's this coming Friday at the home of Malcolm and Deborah Cooper. We're also in the stewardship season. You'll see on the back cover of your bulletin a pledge card. Most of you probably received one in the mail. But if you have it, you could use this one uh, to turn in uh, with your pledge. And we ask you to prayerfully consider that. And I'd like Bill Stahl to come up now and share with us a word about stewardship. Good morning. I'm Bill Stahl, and I'm here to talk to you about pledging. Now, I know no one here really wants to hear me tell you why you should dig deep. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to tell you why Evelyn and I pledge and why it's important to us. Mother Teresa, when uh, asking for donations to support her ministry, often said, you must give until it hurts. Well, as much as I respected Mother Teresa, I don't agree with that. I think we should give until it makes us happy. I see pledging in part as an investment, an investment into my spiritual well-being, which affects my emotional well-being as well. And I have found that over the years, this investment has paid big dividends. I'm going to give you an example of just one. I lost my dad just last month. He was a good dad, very good dad, good friend, and I was blessed to have him for 72 years. So I'm naturally going through the grieving process, but my overwhelming emotion is that of real happiness for my dad. He lived way up in Minnesota, and just uh, two weeks before he died, I visited him for two days. He was in a care center, his health was failing. Nevertheless, we had a, a really good visit. And when it came time for me to leave, he said to me, well, you may never see me again, but I'm not afraid of dying. I'll see your mom again. And then his eyes brightened. And he said, and I'll see my mom too. So how can I not be happy for him? Dad's faith replaced the natural fear of death with joyous expectation. My faith is replacing the natural grieving process with happiness for my dad. And just where did this faith come from? Largely, it came from right here, Trinity Church. I've been a member of Trinity for almost 40 years. And yes, I had faith when I came here. But over these years, my faith has grown by leaps and bounds and gives me the strength to go through difficult times relatively easily. Those are the big <laughs> dividends that investment in the Trinity makes. Now, to finish here, I'm going to address something else. Uh, Evelyn suggested that I address the question, what would Jesus have to say, hey, about, <laughs> what would Jesus have to say about pledging? She can ask the good questions. 
Well, I thought about that, and as I recall, Jesus didn't have much to say about money or about donating. But there was one occasion when he did. He and his apostles were in the temple. And according to, from my study and research of the Gospels, I believe this was likely on the evening of Palm Sunday. And they watched people come in and make donations to the temple treasury. Finally, an old widow woman came in, emptied her purse, and gave the few pennies that she had to the treasury. And Jesus said to his apostles, she gave more than anyone before her because she gave all that she had. And so I think it seems to me that to Jesus, the amount that we pledge is not important. It's our commitment that counts. It's our investment into our spiritual well-being that matters to him. I think pledging is more than just a gift of money. It's a pledge of commitment of oneself to be of service to this church and to make a contribution for others' benefit, which always benefits ourselves as well. And so let's give. Let's give even more than we did before. Let's keep on giving until it makes us happy.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be Jesus, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain what you promise, make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Job. Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you declare to me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself. I repent in dust and ashes. And the, and the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before, and they ate bread with him in his house. They showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning, and he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a thousand yoke of oxen and a thousand donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named the first Gemini, the second Keziah, and the third Karen Habuk. In all the land there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived for 140 years. He saw his children and his children's children 
four generations. And Job died old and full of days. The word of the Lord. Bless the Lord at all times. I will glory in the Lord. Proclaim with me the greatness of the Lord. I sought the Lord and he answered me. Look upon him and be radiant. I called in my affliction and the Lord heard me. The angel of the Lord encompasses those who fear them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Many are the troubles of the righteous. He will keep safe all his bones. Evil shall slay the wicked. The Lord ransoms the life of his servants. reading from the letter to the Hebrews. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But Jesus holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, who has no need to offer, he has no need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then those for the people, this he did once and for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests those who are subject to weakness. But the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. The word of the Lord.
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Jesus and his disciples came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Please be seated. The Gospel story we just heard, a blind beggar asked Jesus for help. The crowds wanted him to be quiet and go away, but Jesus says, call him here. So the beggar jumps up, throws off his cloak, and comes to Jesus. Jesus gets right to the point and asks the blind beggar a question. What do you want me to do for you? And the blind beggar answers Jesus, let me see again. Jesus heals the man for his faith. And then the once blind beggar follows Jesus on the way. It was an amazing encounter for a man who presumably sat in the same spot year after year helpless, blind, and lost. What does the story have to do with you and with me today? Can you imagine just for a moment Jesus walking through downtown Columbus, Georgia today and us having a chance meeting with him, you or me, and then Jesus asking, what do you want me to do for you? It's really hard to imagine this scenario. I am not blind or seriously ill. I have a good job, a great family, good friends. I have health care. What could I possibly ask for? Well, my car is about 10 years old and has lots of miles on it. It would be nice to ride around in a car that didn't have the check engine light on all the time. But that would be silly. And I would never really ask for that kind of help. But seriously, what would we ask for? What kind of thoughtful answer would we give to Jesus if he asked us that question. What about us would we most like to ask him for help with? Maybe we would ask Jesus to help us let go of an old hurt, something that happened to us long ago that we just hold on to. Maybe we'd want Jesus to help us be more forgiving more understanding of others who are difficult for us to deal with. Maybe we'd ask Jesus to help us be more generous. Maybe we'd ask Jesus to help us be more accepting of realities that we have no control over. Maybe we'd ask for peace of mind. All of these would be great things to ask Jesus for. When Bartimaeus 
makes his request and Jesus grants his wish, Bartimaeus' life was changed forever. Bartimaeus gives up everything. The Gospel writer tells us that Jesus was on his way. But that way of Jesus was to lead him to the cross. And Bartimaeus goes there with him. And then Bartimaeus would have had that same calling to continue on the way after the death and resurrection of Jesus to spread the gospel message wherever he could. A challenging and difficult way for Bartimaeus to follow. Bartimaeus asks for sight. Perhaps that is also what we should ask Jesus for. Maybe we are all blind to some extent, spiritually blind. At least we should acknowledge that there are things that we cannot see around us. We just don't see them. We don't want to see them. Maybe we even choose to be blind in some ways in our lives. What would our lives be like if we really could see what is lacking in our own hearts and then ask Jesus for it? Risk asking Jesus for that. What would our church be like if we really saw all the needs that are here around us and ask Jesus for the grace and courage to serve and be responsive and help when we see a need? What would our stewardship campaign yield for the gospel if we asked Jesus to help us see the importance of honoring God with our money? What would our city be like if we all asked Jesus to help us really see our neighbors, the beggars that we so easily choose to ignore, the poverty that we don't notice when we go our way, the injustices all around us? When we ask Jesus for sight, our hearts are changed too. And like Bartimaeus, it comes with a price. We must be willing to follow Jesus in the way, living and becoming more like Jesus every day. And so, seeing, if Jesus granted us that, would change our lives. Seeing would make us different. Seeing would make us more like Jesus. But Jesus gives us the grace we need when we need it. He gives us help for the journey, strength when we need it, nourishment at his table, and the promise of his word that we have his help and that we are never alone. When Jesus opens our eyes, our hearts and hands will also be opened. And what a blessing that will be for us and for the whole world. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
Deliver him, O Lord, from the way of sin and death. Lord, hear our prayer. Open his heart to your grace and truth. Lord, hear our prayer. Fill him with your holy and life-giving spirit. Lord, hear our prayer. Keep him in the faith and communion of your holy church. Lord, hear our prayer. Teach him to love others in the power of the spirit. Lord, hear our prayer. Send him into the world and witness to your love. Lord, hear our prayer. Bring him to the fullness of your peace and glory. Lord, hear our prayer. Grant your Lord that all who are baptized into the death of Jesus Christ, your Son, may live in the power of his resurrection and look for him to come again in glory, who lives and reigns now and forever. Amen. Amen.
Let us welcome the reader baptized. We receive you into the house of God. Confess the faith in Christ Jesus Christ. Proclaim his resurrection. And share with us his eternal existence. Please stand. Peace of the Lord be always with you.